Good afternoon, everyone, or good morning, sorry. Well, on behalf of Good Shepherd, I'd like to greet you all. My name is Pastor Richard Hiltebrand, and it is my privilege to be the pastor here. And wanted to make a few opening announcements uh, before we get started. The first is, if you have little ones in the house this morning, they are more than welcome to stay. However, uh, if they get a little bit rambunctious and you're like, what do I do? We have child care available. So if you need to, right through those doors there, there are background check servants who would love to help you out with your little ones if need be. And also there is a cry room in the back there as well. And there's a speaker so you can hear everything that is going on. Secondly, uh, we want to let you know that, that the restrooms, the easiest way to get to the restrooms is through that door there and take the hallway all the way down. If you don't mind being public, they are right behind that door, so rock and roll, go for it, all right? Thirdly, I have no doubt that there will be laughter and tears that will be shared in this space together. Uh, I want you to know there are tissues separated all throughout the pews, so if you are a designated tissue holder, uh, please look around and make sure that uh, you help a brother or sister out. Amen? Amen. And so uh, we are excited to have you here. And one final note, uh, as we conclude the worship service here in the sanctuary, we want to remind you that we have a wonderful meal prepared. And so the family would be blessed and honored if you would stick around and enjoy some food with us afterwards. And so that is uh, open to all, and we are excited to have you. With that being said, I'd like to call us to attention this morning with our call to worship. Our call to worship comes out of John 11, and let me give you a little backstory. In this section, one of Jesus' good friends, Lazarus, has passed away from an illness. And Jesus has waited intentionally three days before he makes the trip to Bethany, and he is on his way there. And as he is making his way, Martha, the sister of Lazarus, sees him coming from a far way off, and she runs up to him. And we join here in John eleven twenty three as we begin with her first statement to Jesus. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. And Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet he shall live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. Would you join me in a prayer this morning? Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for the life of Ron Reese. Lord, we thank you for the memories, the laughters, the tears, the ways in which we feel connected together, the ways in which we are grieving. God, we trust all of these things to you in this sacred space. Lord, would you prepare our hearts this morning to, to say our final goodbyes? Would you also prepare us to uh, hear about the eternal hope that is promised in you? Lord, we thank you for all the ways in which you're moving and working. Would you bless us and keep us? We ask this in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now I will read the obituary. If I mess up any names, family in the front row, please feel free to throw a shoe openly correct. However, uh, we need to do this. Ronald Ron Reese, 72, passed away on April 8, 2022 at 11.44 a.m. at Blanchard Valley Hospital in Finley, surrounded by his loving family. Ron was born December 21, 1949, in Bluffton, Ohio, to the late Lur and Evelyn Reese, who survives in Pandora. On September 16, 1972, he, mar he married Joan, which I know her as Joni, uh, Schwablin, who's now a Reese, who survives in Mount Quarry, Ohio. Ron graduated from Corey Rawson High School in 1968. He then graduated from the Ohio State University with a bachelor's degree in animal science in 1973. Ron was in the United States Army Reserves and was honorably discharged after six years of service. He was a lifetime member right here at Good Shepherd United Methodist Church. Ron was a bold follower of Jesus Christ. He was a farmer for most of his life and took great pride in his dairy, hog, and grain farm. He was also passionate about being a great steward of his land. 
Ron was a founding member of the Nova Agra Fertilizer Company. He was a family man and cherished his wife, Joan, and loved his children and grandchildren dearly. Ron always enjoyed spending time with his family at various game nights, holidays, and just getting together for supper. Ron also found joy in going to Hemlock Lake in Michigan with his beloved family and friends. Ron is survived by his mother, Evelyn Reese of Pandora, his wife, Joan Reese of Mount Cory, Ohio, his children, Jennifer, Jen, and Jeff Wall of Columbus, Ohio, Carrie and Matthew Spohn of Ulysses, Texas, Eric and Kimberly Reese of Mount Cory, Ohio, Anna and Brendan Reiners of Delta, Ohio, Kelsey and Nick Hirsch of New Albany, Ohio, and grandchildren, Rachel, Ali, Joseph, and Benjamin Wall, Kaya, Spohn, Daniel, Abby, Andrew, Josie, Reese, Samuel, Jenna, Gideon, Reiners, and siblings, David and Jan Reese of Mount Cory, Kathy Inniger of Columbus, Ohio, and Jana and Steve Ochmitz of Pandora, Ohio, and numerous nieces and nephews. He was preceded in death by his brother-in-law, Mike Inniger. And so in a second, we're going to sing, but before that, uh, we're going to hear, uh, I wanted just to share uh, my favorite thing about Ron, which is, I, I love that you never had to guess what Ron was thinking. He was a bold and direct guy, and I love that because that is one of uh, my character traits as well. So as a matter of fact, I was talking to some gentlemen downstairs, and they said, who am I going to argue with in Sunday school class anymore? And, and, uh, and I remember that Ron helped form a life group. He wanted to form a life group for farmers, right, to base around the, the random schedules that had that. But, but in Ron Reese fashion, he decided he found a book by a gentleman named David Platt. I don't know if you know who David Platt is, but he was a missionary who came back to America, saw that the church was in desperate need in America, and he penned a book called Radical that basically challenges us to uh, be the hands and feet of Jesus, right? The book is incredibly challenging if you've never read it. And Ron, Ron shows up to his, his one of the first studies that, that they did, and they're like, we're going to do this book radical. And it led them to doing all sorts of creative service projects and, and things like that. Ron was a bold follower of Jesus. And so I know you're going to hear this. Pastor Kimberly is going to say this. There are going to be several people who are going to say this. But I just have to say, if you don't know who Jesus is, if you don't know who Jesus is, Ron would want you to know who Jesus is, and he would want you to follow Jesus. So please, do not leave this place today without talking to somebody. I would love to talk to you. Kimberly would love to talk to you. Somebody would love to talk to you about Jesus. Ron would want you to know who Jesus is. Amen? Amen. And now we are going to sing together. Uh, it is well with my soul. So if you're able, please stand and you need to sing out loud because I am not doing this by myself. That is not happening.
God, you may be seated. Now, we all appreciate obituaries. It certainly gives us a glimpse into someone's life, but they also miss the good stuff, the memories, the laughter, the characteristics. So we're excited to have some of the family share to give a little bit of that greater picture about the large impact that Ron has had in so many different lives. So first, we'll be hearing from Matt's uh, son-in-law. morning, everyone. I'm just going to share uh, just a few things about Ron briefly. So as some of y'all know, um, my wife Carrie and I met at a, a youth facility in East Texas. We were both on staff there. It was 2004 in February, and I'm walking outside of our property, and I'm with Carrie. We were friends at the time, and this green Toyota minivan drives up on the driveway, and Lo and behold, my future father-in-law gets out of the van with his wife and with two little girls who are Anna and Kelsey. I first meet Ron, I introduce myself, and he said, Ron Reese, good to meet you. Little did I know that I would get to know this man uh, for several years after that. Fast forward about a year, and Carrie and I continue to date, and we've decided that we want to get married. We wanted to make it a short engagement for, for several reasons. Uh, once you know that you're going to get married, you just know. So we figured, let's, let's do a short engagement. And what I did was, was call Ron over the phone to ask his blessing. Carrie prepared me for it. <laughs> so after a, a fairly brief five-minute conversation... Small talk got out of the way, and I asked Ron for his blessing, and he said yes, and immediately after that, he said, well, let's get you guys married, so he wasn't wasting any time. I think he had a date set before we did already. <laughs> he just didn't say it. Fast forward a little bit later, uh, several years later, as a matter of fact, uh, Gary and I were, were blessed to... Um, adopt our daughter, Kaya, and as we uh, brought her home from India, uh, noticing um, a softer side of Ron, a side that I had seen, but not uh, particularly in a, in a personal way, um, but understanding the heart that he has uh, for family, especially children and grandchildren, and seeing the heart and love that he had toward our daughter accepting her as, as his own, and seeing the different sides of Ron that I know most, if not all of you, have seen at one point or another. One thing I want to mention, uh, some of you have probably heard this too, Ron, of course, loved to talk pretty much about anything. Um, he and my father, when they would meet, would talk a lot about politics and religion. Um, about four years ago, my father passed away from complications of cancer. I had the privilege of, of having a, a good relationship with my father. And shortly after that happened, we were up visiting from Texas. And Ron and I were having a discussion about death and life and, and politics and farming and pretty much anything. At the end of the conversation, as he had mentioned several times, Ron said, you know, I know two things. I know there is a God, and I'm not him. We can know for sure that Ron is now living his best life. Keep that in mind. He is completely, utterly free from the burden of this world. You know, Scripture says in 2 Corinthians 5, Paul says specifically, that we groan in this body, but we have a body waiting for us if we have trusted in Jesus Christ as our Savior. Ron is in eternity right now because he trusted in Jesus. He put his faith in Christ, and we too have that salvation and that hope. And so, in closing, let us remember Ron for who he was as a man, as a father, as a husband, as a farmer, 
so many things to everyone. But just the life that he left and the legacy that he left for everyone is something we can be proud of to know him as a man. Thank you. Thanks, Matt. We'll hear from Alyssa Bixler next, one of Ron's nieces. Whenever my family and I think of Uncle Ron, he just makes us smile. First, because he likes to tease us and make us laugh, but secondly, because we knew that he loved us and valued us, and he made a deliberate attempt or just effort to reach out, ask us questions, be um, intentional about building a relationship. Um, it was playful and joking, but purposeful. Um, I'm gonna share some memories from different people in my family. Um, my brother-in-law Isaac's first meeting with Uncle Ron was actually at the lake, and they were tearing floorboards out together. Um, so they were working hard, and um, this and Ron, you know, really valued hard work and acknowledged that. Um, so it was a good way as a suitor for his niece to build some good rapport. Um, and um, during that time, you know, he and Isaac had some really good conversations. Ron, you know, just getting to know him was just really intentional about getting to know Isaac, making connections, um, but valuing that time, just getting there dirty and working, so. Um, my husband Steve says some of his favorite memories were at family gatherings, especially Thanksgiving gatherings, where Ron and Joni so graciously often hosted our family. Um, and he would bring a lot of intensity and laughs to the long anticipated games of Rook, which you can probably all sometimes experience that. Um, but at the same time, he just, um, made a point to listen and laugh with our kids, and then really took time to be grateful and pause and as a family give thanks and, and was a leader in making sure as a family that we spent time doing that. I wanna read what my sister said because I can't say it better than her. So um, she said, from early in my life, Uncle Ron's encouragement made me believe that I could do challenging things. As a first grader skiing through what seemed like giant waves at the lake, I held on for dear life and made it through because I knew Uncle Ron certainly wouldn't drive through those waves if he didn't believe I could do it. <laughs> and that is absolutely true. <laughs> um, he consistently engaged with his nieces and nephews in backyard football games, basketball games in the barn. His ornery laugh and high fives when I played aggressive defense motivated me to play even harder. As an adult, Uncle Ron showed interest in my husband and kids' lives by asking about jobs, sports, and church while keeping us up to date on local school jobs available to making sure that we knew our kids would look great in green and gold. <laughs> His interests in our lives will always be valued. I also have a lot of memories of Uncle Ron, uh, family gatherings at the lake, um, tossing us for hours and hours into the lake and driving the boat over those huge waves and trying to throw us off the boat. Um, but also just always felt like valued by Uncle Ron, that he was intentional about when we were in gatherings, you know, check it in, how are things going, teasing, but it was purposeful. And I just reflected on that, how he, I see him still doing that in the next generation with my kids, nieces and nephews, and um, his grandkids, and just really like see in his life how he valued young people and youth, and then just seeing even where his memorial fund is going, I could just, you know, further like, emphasizes how much he valued investing in the next generation, and I'm just so thankful I benefited from that. Um, for my mom, a memory that stands out to her um, were the interactions they had in their teenage years. Um, as a big brother, Ron offered to drive Kathy to school, which was a pretty big deal versus riding the bus. Um, and during their time together in the car, he would um, let her know, you know, which guy would be good or not so good to date. So <laughs> he was looking out for her as a big brother. And then thankfully, when she met the love of her life her junior year, Ron approved and gave her the thumbs up, which um, I was just thinking how, you know, even with my dad, he and Ron had a lot of history and went back, you know, even into high school years. And, and that's a rich thing. Um, we're also grateful that Uncle Ron valued family um, with his actions made in made an effort to encourage our family to meet together and how important that was. 
Finally, I also had a chance to ask his mom um, to share a few memories. And Grandma's heart is broken at losing her son, but she shared a few um, articulate things. She said, he was a tease, just a tease, but good-hearted underneath. <laughs> he was a hard worker, a very hard worker. He was straightforward. What you see is what you get. He was very honest and a good example to all of us, no matter our age. As we celebrate Ron on the very day of Holy Week, where we remember Jesus showing love by washing his disciples' feet, it strikes us how, Joni, you and Ron have raised five children who exemplify that servant leadership and love in their lives. And that says a lot. Losing Uncle Ron will leave a huge hole in our family, but we're so grateful for his intentionality and the legacy he's leaving behind. Thanks, Alyssa. Next, we'll hear from Brendan Reiner's uh, son-in-law. I tried to make it through. Oh, man. My first memory of Ron, I called him on the phone from Texas to, to talk to him about dating Anna because I wanted to do it right, you know? And, and Ron gets on the phone. He's like, hello? I'm like, hey. Uh, how are you, Mr. Ron, sir? <laughs> and he's like, I'm good. What are your intentions with my daughter? <laughs> and I was like, well, I'm going to date her until I marry her or until something else happens. Yeah, I mean, until I... Don't... <laughs> That's not what I meant. <laughs> Jesus, help me. Uh, or until I don't, you know? And he's like... All right, and then we spent the next 45 minutes talking about where I grew up in Colorado and football in Ohio State, and it was, it was great. And, and I remember the first time that I met him, he gave me a hug. And I know Ron doesn't, Ron doesn't give a lot of hugs to, like, guys, you know? And so it was, like, it was, it was impactful. And I think that speaks to the life of Ron as, as a whole, you know, like everything that the two previous people have said, like Ron was very intentional. And he was just like Jesus in that aspect. Everything Jesus did, when he, when he didn't go to, to Bethany for three days until after Lazarus was already dead, he did that intentionally. You know, when he went through Samaria to meet the Samaritan woman, he did it with intention. And it was because that person needed to know the love of Jesus. They needed to know the love of a father. And Ron, Jesus. Ron spoke things into my life that my, my dad never did. And it was his son-in-law. That was, that was a huge thing that I valued. You know, Ron looked at Anna and I's lives, and a lot of stuff we do is kind of crazy. <laughs> and we move a lot because we follow wherever God calls us, and Ron has never, never discounted us for, for our faith. He's always, he's always been proud of us for how we follow the Lord's leading in our lives. And he's al he, always, he always saw bigger picture, you know, like Ron saw the way that God saw things. Like, he didn't see just like a little snapshot that we see in a picture up here. Ron, Ron had, the Lord gave Ron eyes to see farther into the future. And so, as, as we continue to hear about what Ron has done for each of us, and I know Ron has touched everybody in this room and the hundreds of people that came through it last night. You know, his legacy, <laughs> that his kids will love Jesus. That's the best thing that he could have hoped for. Um, I was reading earlier this week uh, in, in Proverbs 12, and um, in the, I'm, I'm just going to read some scripture that I thought spoke exactly to who Ron was. It says, If your heart is right, favor flows from the Lord. But a devious heart invites his condemnation. You can't expect success by doing what's wrong, but the lives of his lovers are deeply rooted and firmly planted. And I think of Ron's, Ron's family, and they are deeply rooted and they're firmly planted in the word of God. 
and in Jesus. The integrity and strength of a virtuous wife, Joni, transforms her husband into an honored king. But So I just want to speak to you too because man, you honored Ron. And it was so evident. So bless you, woman of God. The lovers of God are filled with good ideas that are noble and pure. And I think I read that and I'm like, man, like Ron had such a business mindset, you know, or an entrepreneur mindset. And like everything that Anna and I tried to do with our business or or anybody else's business, like Ron just had great ideas because he had a relationship with the Lord and he listened to what the father spoke, just like Jesus did. Um, The wicked are taken out and gone for good, but the godly family shall live on. And this, I think, is the key, because almost everybody in here, I think, is related somehow. I, you know? Like, almost everybody in this room is, is related in some way or another, through blood or through marriage. And that just speaks to the testament of, of not, just, not just Ron, but, but the legacy of your family. And so I want each of you to know that like, I'm honored to marry into this family. Because my family did not love each other like this. You guys love well. Yeah, there's lots of teasing and there's lots of sarcasm sometimes. And, and my heart doesn't take that very well. But Ron, Ron, did, Ron did a really good job talking to me in a way that I knew I was loved. You know? And so, like... Like, you guys have something to be proud of in your family. Everyone admires a man of principle. Verse 8 says, Everyone admires a man of principle, but the one who has corrupt heart is despised. Just be who you are and work hard for a living, for that is better than pretending to be important and starving to death. And I think Ron exemplified that verse and this verse. It's a, verse 11 says, Work hard at your job and you'll have what you need. Um, and then verse 12 says, the crave, uh, la, 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 la. nope, but the righteous is the core motivation, righteousness is the core motivation of the lovers of God, and it keeps them, from, keeps them content and flourishing. And I think that is evident in his family sitting in front of you today, that he was content and his family was flourishing because of the way that he pursued Jesus. And I get, I get like the ripple effect of that, you know? And so as a son-in-law, like, I'm going to echo what Richard said. If you don't know Jesus, man, get to know him, because he'll change your life. And he'll help you to walk this, this out. He'll help you to walk out the things that Ron walked out in his life. And this is the last thing I'm going to read. And it says, verse 14 says, For there is great satisfaction in speaking truth, and hard work brings blessings back to you. And so, I'm just going to leave that at that. We're all blessed because Ron, Ron loved well. And he did a great job of raising his family and being a husband and a father. And man, my kids loved their grandpa. You know, there was never a time where we walked into that house and he didn't drop things that he was doing to throw them on the couch or throw them up in the air or take Samuel out in the tractor. And that's a legacy worth, worth remembering. So that's all I got to share. Thank you, Brendan. Matthew, one of the nephews, will be sharing next. These are all tough acts to follow. A lot of good folks in this room. The world we woke up in today was very different than it was just a few days ago for all those in this room who knew Ron. <clears throat> but the world we woke up in today was also very different from the world that I grew up in where we were so blessed to have just an incredible family around us. And that includes parents, grandparents, aunts, uncles. And uh, my brothers and I were so fortunate to have uh, such a good group of folks to look up to and to mentor us 
and uh, so forth. So we spent a lot of time with Uncle Ron by proxy. We lived a quarter mile down the road from the pig farm, right? And, uh, right? And so we learned some rules from Uncle Ron. I think I asked my brothers and, and my parents, and we came up with some rules we learned from Uncle Ron. I want to share them with you. <laughs> Number one, if it touched your fingertips, you should have caught it. <laughs> my brothers and I spent a fair amount of time throwing the football and playing basketball with Uncle Ron. An on-target pass is an opportunity that should not be missed. If the pass comes your way, be focused, be prepared, and for goodness sakes, if it makes the slightest contact with any part of your body, that ball best not hit the ground. That's one. Number two. Make sure to tighten the drawstring on your trunks and finalize your last will and testament before you climb on the tube in Hemlock Lake. <laughs> Uncle Ron driving the boat, pulling you on the tube in Hemlock Lake was always a life-changing, almost life-ending experience. <laughs> of course, my brothers and I would taunt Uncle Ron, which would make things much worse. I can remember being sore for days after a few rounds on a tube pulled by him at the helm. And I speak from experience when I tell you those trunks need to be tied tight. <laughs> I'm just saying. Number three, pigs smell like money. Laundry hung on the line smells like pigs, but not money. <laughs> we learned many lessons helping Uncle Ron with the pigs, but most are best not shared here. <laughs> Uncle Ron always did say pigs smelled like money, which certainly held true sometimes, until you wore your new shirt to school that had been washed and dried on the clothesline outside. <laughs> then it just smelled like, well, pigs. <laughs> Number four, do what you love and love what you do and work hard at it. Ron loved God, Ron loved his family, Ron loved the farm. He showed up, he put in tremendous effort, and he worked hard. And if you ever wondered if Ron loved what he did, you quickly found out if you heard him joyfully whistling hymns while working in the shop or feeding animals or heard the fervor in his voice when he talked about God or saw his eyes fill with pure joy at the sight of his grandchildren and family members. He was grateful and thankful for his blessings, he worked tirelessly to build upon them. Uncle Ron was an incredible example of a work ethic, father, joyous grandfather, and a man of God for all of us to learn from. Number five, this is the last one. Invest in a legacy that matters. I'm talking about a legacy bigger here, folks, than the Lord J. Reese Memorial water cooler down in the basement. Okay? <laughs> That's big. But there's things that are bigger, okay? My brothers and I took a selfie with it today. <laughs> Ron, like his father before him, lived with purpose and a plan, and he knew where he was headed. Ron's work mattered and will leave a lasting legacy. Many who knew Ron would be quick to recognize the legacy he left on the land through his work on the farm. He was passionate about the long game of improving the land on his farm business for the future. And he did just that, not doing what was easy, but what, what he felt like was right. And he didn't do what was standard. He invented new and better ways of doing things. But you don't need to drive halfway across the countryside out here to go see what he did on the land. In fact, you don't even need to leave the church today to see his most important legacy. The wonderful family right here is an incredible testament to the type of man Uncle Ron was. The beautiful, God-fearing, salt and light, Christ-focused people who remain here to carry on the work that both he and Joni started together showcases how valuable one marriage can be and the ripple effect one man's life can have. Now that he has uh, gotten to where he knew he was going, I know that Ron's legacy of faith will live on through his wife, his children, his children's children, and everyone in here today. 
Bronze is a legacy that matters eternally, built on the dedicated work of a good and faithful servant who whistled all the while. Thanks, Matthew. We'll have Jeff Wall share next, uh, another son-in-law. Well, at first I was just glad I wasn't following Brandon, but, <laughs> geez. Um, so, I've been, you know, Ron's son-in-law since 1998, so uh, I guess if you count the years we were dating, we're like at 25 years I've known Ron, and, um, you know, when we got married, Eric was a undersized middle school guy, <laughs> and... And now look at him, I mean, he's a full-grown man, he's got a beautiful wife and family, and uh, four kids, and you know, you're, you're well on your way to leading this family and being the man of the family, and your dad is proud of you. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, I, going back like 25 years, like when Jen and I started dating, uh, Larry J passed away, and uh, I remember sitting in uh, the church for that, and Steve Amstutz stood up and spoke. And I remember thinking, man, none of the family got up. Steve, the in-law, had to get up. <laughs> so I've been planning I might have to do this for a while. <laughs> if this worked out, I... Um, but in all seriousness, you know, some reflections on Ron, I think I would say he was a man's man, you know, in all the good ways. He was a straight shooter. Um, he's a tough guy. He didn't complain. A lot of grit to him. Um, he, in all the really good ways, right, he, uh, in none of the bad ways. He, he was a guy that would say, you know, real men love Jesus. Not ashamed of that. And uh, told me when I asked to marry Jen, you know, he said, I don't want any, you know, you need to be the man of the house. You, I don't want a, a wimpy man in this family. I don't want a man who leaves spiritual leading to his wife. You know, you're going to lead my grandchildren, not Jen. Oh, sorry, yeah, but you, he meant it in a good way. Um, you know, but none of the bad ways. He didn't buy into any of the cultural stuff about what a man's supposed to be. I mean, I didn't help him with the pigs, so I, I'm not fully sure, but I, he was pretty good on the curse words. He, and... Uh, as in, he, he, was cool, he kept it, it clean. Um, you know, he didn't buy into, the man was supposed to be the dope, you know, the dummy, the overgrown child. He didn't buy into any of that. Um, he was always respectful and appropriate with women and talking about women. Um, he was a real man's man. It's a, it's a terrible shame that my boys won't get more time with him, you know, um, and all the other grandkids as well. Uh, I would encourage all the grandparents in the room, you know, you, in some ways as you age, you feel like your influence shrinks, but it actually just gets intensely focused on a few little people called your grandkids. Yeah. And, you know, so into them, you've got so much to give. Um, you know, another, you've heard it already, but Ron just loved and delighted in his family and, and just people in general. You know, I was his uh, son-in-law, but, you know, I was fully welcomed in. I wasn't held at arm's length, they're like an in-law, and, uh, you know, my parents and, and family would get invited to Reese gatherings because they lived nearby. Um, you know, he absolutely delighted in his nuclear family, but it extended out to all of his, I think, 100,000 nieces and nephews. <laughs> um, but every time I saw him, he would say, you know, that Luke Scheiblin is so smart, he knows you know, this and that and everything about this. And did you read Matthew's latest country journal? It was so good, so good. Um, yeah, I would get every update from whatever he most recently had heard from the Amstutzes or the Scheiblins or the Inigers or the Reeses. You know, you, you knew what was going on with them. It was always positive. It was never about somebody did something knuckleheaded. You just, that stuff had to happen, but Ron didn't report those 
he just delighted in his entire family. Um, and then it extended out to everybody he interacted with. He just liked to get to know people and learn who they were and ask questions. And uh, as you heard from lots of folks, very intentional about it. And, you know, then finally, my final reflection on him is, uh, you know, he really provided a spiritual example and legacy. Um, you know, he and Joni modeled a very healthy, godly marriage. You know, they not only loved each other, they liked each other all these years. Um, they raised five kids, all of whom strongly followed Jesus as adults. That's, that's no small thing. Uh, just generally, day in, day out, as you get up and go to sleep, he, he lived out biblical wisdom and tried to do it right. Um, I mean, for me personally, you know, he raised my wife and gave me both his permission and blessing to marry her. Um, he loved our kids. And uh, for the entire family, I feel like we're inheritors of kind of the generational love for Jesus that uh, Evelyn will blame you for it, I guess. Uh, but it, it rolls down through the generations, and uh, there are a lot of blessings that come with that. That are, And so I would just say to Ron, well done. Um, I am sure the basketball courts in heaven are very nice. And uh, there are a lot of people there for him to catch up with and to meet and ask all the many questions of them that he would have asked of you the next time he saw you. So, Thanks, Jeff. Next, we'll be hearing from Nate, his nephew, along with Jana, Ron's sister. Well, thank you so much for all of the support and love that we have so felt. The family has been overwhelmed with the body of Christ at work, so thank you for that. First of all, Ron was a picker. From my earliest memories, he was pick and tease and pick and tease. That's how he said he made us tough. <laughs> so, but it was um, definitely his Ron's love language. Picking and teasing was his love language. And through it all, it will, um, he will be remembered for seriously the love that he had for his family. And um, like so many people have said before, he lit up with those grandkids, lit up. And he enjoyed every single one of them. And then secondly, his love for Joni. He loved and adored her and always said, she's my beautiful bride, all the time. He always said that and spoke of her. So then the, his commitment to Jesus Christ was so evident in all that he did and all that he stood for. I had the blessing of talking with Ron two days before his passing. We chatted about many things, but the main conversation centered around his desire for heaven. His direct words were, I hope I die in my sleep, and enter into glory. I am ready to meet Jesus. And he said it with such passion, as you know only Ron could. He was bold in his faith, and he said it with, I'm ready to meet Jesus. Ron is in glory because of his deep faith and acceptance of the Lord Jesus Christ as his personal Savior. What a reassurance we all have as believers to know that we have an eternal home, heaven. Ron got his wish. These are lyrics from a song that we sang in church just this last Sunday. With every breath, I long to follow Jesus, for he has said that he will bring me home. And day by day, I know he will renew me until I stand with joy, joy, he stand with joy before the throne. When the race is complete, still my lips shall repeat, yet not I but through Christ in me. 2 Timothy 4, 7 says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. And I have kept the faith. I will miss you. I'm not quite sure how I got picked to go last. <laughs> um, I should just end this with amen. 
However, I will read my speech. My name is Nathan Amstutz, AKA the Nader Man. That's what Ron called me. I do have a disclaimer I'm gonna make up front. I am half Reese, strong, brave, resilient, and courageous. But I'm also half Amstutz, who do, do still hold the same traits I just mentioned, but who are also known to get a little emotional at times. So, with that being said, I'm gonna try my best to get through this leaning more on the Reese side than the Amstead side for this one. I do want to share three characteristics that have already been mentioned numerous times, but I think it does hold true for just the, the man that Ron was. Um, and so just have to bear with me that we're just kind of going over these again. But he was a hard worker. He knew the meaning of a day's work. I remember working for Ron countless times. Over the years, but one particular time, he told me we were, we were going to be replacing the floor in one of the pig barns. The floors were cement slats weighing several hundred pounds each. And I remember working all day, tearing up the old slats covered in pig poo and then putting in the new ones. After working all day I spent, I was ready to go home. I was, I was done. Ron said, uh, we're all done. You can go home. Um, however, once I was done, he now had to go and do all the evening chores. So I get home, I hit the shower quick, ate a quick bite of food, and I was in bed out cold probably by 7.30. But that was just one day for me working on the pig farm, but for Ron, he did that day in and day out, a typical day's work for a pig farmer. He was a family man. The year was 2000. I was a senior in high school. And I finally got the chance to start as a running back for Pandora, Gilboa Rockets. I knew Ron was super excited to come and watch me. <clears throat> he always would be at the end zone of where the Rockets would be scoring and whether I was <clears throat> the one scoring the touchdown or one of my teammates, he was always there to point at me or for my team. Now this one we have not heard. That was the only year out of his entire life I can honestly say that Ron had renounced his hornet roots and became a rocket. <laughs> I cannot blame him. Ron liked being on the winning side. <laughs> Another example of how very important family was was as part of Ron's life is knowing that every holiday since I can remember, he and Joni either planning or hosting events and making sure the entire family was offered the chance to get together. It's all about family. Finally, he was a godly man. <clears throat> there is no doubt that Ron loved Jesus. The way he lived his life, raised his children, and set an example to others. The, the characteristics is the most important and yet simple. For those of us who know Jesus as our Lord and Savior, we know the promise that we get to see him in, in heaven again. So this is my prayer for Ron and all of us. Number six, 24 through 26. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May his, shine, his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May he show you his favor and give you his peace. Thank you. And as a final memory, just one that I will read is from his his daughter, Kelsey. One thing I will forever be grateful for is how dad was intentional about sharing his faith. I can remember countless conversations I had with him about faith, Jesus, the Bible, and faith-based books. A lot of this was discussed during the many tractor rides, days of working in the barn together, and just some late night chats. One of my early memories with my dad in the tractors when he was sharing with Anna and I the gift of asking Jesus into our hearts. He said that we can invite Jesus into our hearts, but if we've already done it, we don't have to keep doing it over and over again because Jesus lives there now. I am so thankful that my dad shared with me the greatest gift of all, the gift of faith in Jesus Christ. If you have not yet made the decision to make Jesus your personal Lord and Savior, I know he would want the same for you too. Like he told us, once you've done it, Jesus lives there now. And out of all the lessons that dad taught me, this one has been the greatest. 
So we have heard many, many stories and memories, and I'm sure it's triggered a whole lot in your own thoughts. And I, uh, just out of curiosity, how many people here have ever been whipped around on a two behind Ron? And <laughs> oh my goodness, that's, that is a lot of people. And yet we are all here today. Some of you may still have really sore necks from that, but I'm really glad <laughs> that you're all here today. And I most certainly have a lot of memories with Ron. So I started in ministry around 15 years ago or so here at Good Shepherd. And I remember my very first Sunday here. The Reeses were sitting right back there, right where his brother Dave is sitting. That's where Ron was at. And I remember the pastor then, Kevin Pease, said, Kimberly, if there's anything that you need, this is Ron and Joni Reese. They're really good people. You should get to know them. They're going to help you out. In which I greatly appreciated knowing that. And it was true. My first years in ministry, I called Ron and Joni numerous times. And I very quickly found out that Ron was an honest man. He was known as an honest man of this church, a man of integrity, that he was a leader and he was filled with wisdom. I'm guessing many of you in this space went to Ron for wisdom and asking questions. I also very quickly found out that Ron had this really good looking son and I was really <laughs> thankful to meet Eric, eventually figuring out he was also the one for me. And so I got an entirely different perspective numerous years later when I became Ron's only daughter-in-law, marrying the one son among all the sisters. And I found that as we have already heard today, who Ron was in this church is the same person he was at home as well. Except that Ron, I found he loved his family. And goodness, he loved those grandkids. And over and over again, he pointed his family to the cross of Jesus as he led his family well. Ron and I spent so much time together, not only as being his daughter-in-law, being in church together, and then being next-door neighbors. We had a lot of different conversations about faith. And him and I tended to share a lot of uh, mutual love and respect for a couple of Christian authors. And so we would get on long conversations about various books. And one sticks out in my mind in particular. It was a book we both, he recommended to me, and um, we enjoyed reading and discussing it. It was Love Does by Bob Goff because this book aligned so much with Ron's thoughts and just who he was and his passions. And it was the idea that as Christians, we need to be love to a broken world, a hurting world around us, and not just talk love to the broken parts of this world. And just talking love is a lot easier. Just talking love is a whole lot more convenient, but being love in the midst of hurt and brokenness, man, that's hard. Because it takes a whole lot of sacrifice. And there was a story that he told me numerous times, so I know it was a formational moment in Ron's life, that it was a Sunday morning, he was getting ready to walk into worship here in this building. And he said as he was getting ready to walk in, one of the friends of, farmer friends that he had drove by in a piece of farm machinery, equipment. And he realized that person was driving over to another family where the dad had just passed away. And it was harvest. They could not get their harvest off that year because the farmer unexpectedly passed. And Ron said in that moment, he knew what love looked like. He, he loved coming to worship. He knew the importance of a Sabbath. He knew the importance of coming together on a Sunday morning. And he said, but then I also realized love takes a lot of action and sacrifice. And that person, my friend, loved that farmer well by sacrificing their own time. And they went and took the harvest off for that family. And he said, I want to be that kind of farmer. I want to sacrifice because that's what Jesus did for me. And he did that over and over again. And I know that one of Ron's greatest fears that we talked about so many times was he did not want to become a Pharisee. He didn't want to just know the teachings of Jesus. He didn't just want to teach about the teachings of Jesus. He wanted to live the teachings of Jesus. And it's that living out part that is hard. Because it means it's an inconvenience to us. And it means we do not put our own desires first and our own wants first. And I think we would probably agree that we live in a rather selfish world. 
where we are told, no, you should put your own happiness first. Do what makes you happy. And in, instead, Ron said, no, do what Jesus wants you to do. You knew, need to be love. And because you are here today, it won't surprise you when I say that Ron and I, Ron could be a little bit vocal and rather opinionated about the brokenness of this world. He very often shared his frustrations about how he disagreed with different leadership or governments or whatever that might be, and it frustrated him to no end that people were not walking toward Jesus, that it seemed like our world around us was walking away from Jesus, and how this caused divisions and finger-pointing even within the church, and this broke his heart because he knew that people needed to love Jesus, needed to know Jesus Christ, and he didn't want any roadblocks in the way for that to happen. And today, I echo Ron's frustrations. This world, it's difficult. I think we'll agree we have a whole lot of pain and suffering and hardships and annoyances that we deal with. And I do believe that on our own, really, we don't have it in us to love other people well. We get frustrated. We want what we want on most days. But I am so thankful that we don't have to figure it out and we don't have to love within our own power because when we do, we usually make it uh, all messed up. Instead, it tells us about the example of Jesus Christ in 1 John 3, 16. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters god knew that in our humanness god knew in our own selfishness we would not be able to love well it's just too hard and so instead god out of an enormous love for his people he decided to rescue us from our own selfishness and instead, he came down to this earth, and he paid the sacrifice we should have paid. He knew the brokenness. He knew the sin. He knew the selfishness. It was too much for us to handle. So he sent Jesus, his only son. Many of you are parents in this room, and you know what it means to love a child. And God sent Jesus, his only son, to the cross to suffer and to die out of love for us. Jesus was perfect, and he did not deserve death, but we do. But his death, it covered our sins. And that ultimately, it empowers us to love like Jesus. Through his Holy Spirit at work in our lives, we are able to love well, and we are able to sacrifice and we are able to step into the world's brokenness. And we saw Ron do that over and over and over again. Because remember, Ron didn't have it in him either to love well. But he knew Jesus Christ. And God was alive and working through Ron in such powerful and dynamic ways. We hear this in John 3, 16, and 17. I know verses you have heard a hundred different times, but I do hope you will hear them with just a fresh perspective today. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Ron knew that this world was far from perfect. Ron knew that he was far from perfect. And yet Ron had a peace and experienced freedom in the midst of fr frustrations and brokenness because of God at work in his life. As Ron was breathing his last in the hospital, the, the family gathered around, and I think that it was Jen that God must have prompted that we should play the song, It Is Well With My Soul, which we sang just moments ago, such powerful lyrics. And so that song has been ringing through my head over and over again since 
our last moments with Ron on Friday morning. And I thought, my goodness, that Ron, that, that song is so fitting, almost a theme song for Ron's life. Because Ron knew, again, that the world wasn't perfect and that we would have sorrows. And we all did, and Ron did too. And yet, Ron had peace because of the victory of Jesus. One of the lines in that beloved hymn says, Sin, it is nailed to the cross. We bear it no more. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O oh my soul. Ron gets to live into the fullness of that sacrifice of Jesus Christ right now. I can't even wrap my mind around it. Can you imagine the conversations Ron is having in heaven? You thought he talked a lot on earth. Can you imagine in heaven what that is going to be like for him? So we praise God today for his victory. We praise God for a life well lived. And we praise God that Ron, he's home where God designed him to be. And I also know that it's because of this sacrifice that Ron's family today, we can also say those same lyrics, it is well with my soul. Because we will have many tears in the days ahead. And that's okay. Our hearts will be very heavy. But it is well with my soul. Because we celebrate in the midst of the grief. We told our kids, and I remind myself, that when Ron went to heaven, it was not a goodbye. It was a see you later, Grandpa. Because he's prepared that home for us, too. I know that you have heard it numerous times today, and so hopefully you understand how important this is to the Reese family. If you do not know Jesus Christ, he loves you. He's prepared an eternal home for you, too. But he loves you so much, he's not going to force that love on you. Instead, he invites you to love him. So I would love the chance to talk with you after the service if you've never made that decision. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for being such a good father. My heart is heavy thinking of what you went through when you sent your son to this world of brokenness knowing he would suffer on a cross for my mistakes, for our sin. And yet you sent him anyway. I can't help but wonder, Lord, if as your son was there dying, if you also had the mixed emotions of celebrating, knowing now your sons and daughters, we get to go home to be with our dad. We praise you that Ron is home. We ask for your presence and your peace in the moments ahead when we are homesick for him. But Heavenly Father, beyond that, we praise you and can only imagine the celebration that took place when you said, well, good, done, and faithful servant. So continue to stir Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We praise your good name. It's in that name that we pray today. Amen. And now in closing, we'll be hearing from the, uh, the Reese boys, as I call them. Um, Ron really loved to hear his nephews sing. And so we will be closing with the song, God Be With You Till We Meet Again, which is one that was um, often sang at the end of one of the family reunions.
Thanks, guys. Ron would have loved it. Would you close in prayer with me? God, we thank you for your unending love. We are thankful that we know your love when life is filled with joy and when life is filled with sorrow. We pray to you for one another in our need today and for really all anywhere who are mourning on this day. To those who doubt, would you give your light? To those who are weak, your strength. To all who have sinned, your mercy. And to all who have sorrow, your peace. Keep true in us the love with which we hold one another. And in all our ways, we trust you. And to you with your church on earth and in heaven, we offer honor and glory and praise, Lord. We also thank you for the moments ahead as we spend a meal together. Thank you for providing for us. And may our conversations bring glory to your good name. Amen. This concludes our service here today, though as we all head downstairs, which you'll be invited to do and share a meal together, um, continue grieving and celebrating, continue sharing as we continue to praise God and honor his son, Ron. So at this time, you're dismissed. You are welcome to go down either of the doors. There's stairs here and here if you would like to be staying for the meal. Thank you.